Okay. So let's start at the beginning again. And when you, if you have a Mac computer, you have to set up a few things on the Mac. I have this in those videos that I sent you a link of, the 10 minute videos, but let's do it right here um, in class today. So you go to your Apple menu, you go to System Preferences. Then you're going to go to Keyboard, and then you're going to go to Shortcuts. Um, spotlight, right? So your computers probably have Spotlight turned on. Spotlight is Command and Space, and Show Finder in Search Window is Option, Command, Space. We're going to turn those off, and let me show you why. Because in Pro Tools, one of the ways to record is Command Spacebar. So if Spotlight is turned on and you do Command Spacebar, then it's not going to record. It's going to show you Spotlight. And I don't know anybody who uses Spotlight myself personally. All right. Now, the second thing is if you go to Keyboard... Do you see right here, it says use F1, F2 keys as standard function keys. If you can remember to do this, it will be very helpful. If you don't remember to do this, it's not a deal breaker in this class, but if you go forward and take future, like the next semester, which we will still be using Pro Tools, um, having access as function keys, gives you, um, there are shortcuts that you can access in Pro Tools by pushing those function keys, right? By pushing these keys up here, it, it helps you to navigate rather than taking your mouse and moving your mouse around to find a, a spot. So it saves you time. Um, and then if you want to use the function keys to turn your volume up and down and to make your brightness, you just have to push the FN button, which is right here on this extended keyboard, and then these all become the regular, what you're used to. So the next thing I would suggest doing is if you have a mouse, or you guys probably have trackpads, but if you have a mouse, make your right click a secondary button so that you can right click on things. That helps you out quite a bit. Let's see, with a trackpad, secondary click, tap with two fingers. So if I say right click and you're using a trackpad, it's tap with two fingers. So once those things are done, you've taken care of the background stuff that needs to be taken care of for Pro Tools. Now you've got Pro Tools inside your applications folder and if you're in a, a using a PC, you'd I forget where it is in a PC, but you'll find it. For Mac, take Pro Tools. What I do is I take it and I drag it down so that it's in my dock and I have it right here. This way, if I want to launch Pro Tools, which I'm going to do in a second, I don't have to go into my Applications folder. I could just go down to my dock and click here and then Pro Tools is launching up. Your, I have Pro Tools HD, so that's why it says Ultimate. It's, it's such a stupid name, but you guys will just say Pro Tools probably. Now, you're going <clears> to... <throat> When you boot up, you're going to get the dashboard here. So for right now, I'm only going to teach you stuff you need, and I'll add more stuff as we go along. There's a lot of functionality here, but we don't need to worry about all of this yet, just the stuff that we need to get working. So you want to set your file type to BWF, Broadcast Wave. Our sample rate is 44.1, and the bit depth should be 24-bit. That's what we're working for. And if you want to check interleaved, that's fine. The next bit is to make sure prompt for location is selected. 
Now, what I would suggest doing is creating a, a, a folder on your desktop and then titling it uh, RSF, Recording Studio Fundamentals. Oh, it's already taken. Whoops, let me do a different one. I'll just call this RSF with my initials. And all my projects will go in that one folder. Now, <clears throat> the best practice is, is to have separate drives. You see, I've got all these extra drives on my desktop. Well, I've got all my projects in this separate drive. I don't have all my projects. I've got all my most recent projects in here for the past year or so. And I've got backups downstairs and at my sister's house. I've got a, a hard drive with stuff in it that's off-site. But for you guys right now, for what we're doing in our class, on your desktop is fine. It'll give you easy access to it. So prompt for location. You're going to title this. And let's say I'm going to title this... Um, I just think of a quick name first. First session. And then underscore the date, underscore your initials. And let me fix that date. Just remember when you're doing things, backslashes and slashes and question marks are, there are like illegal characters in Pro Tools. I don't know why they're illegal but they're illegal. So you have to use dashes and underscores. I even think that um, a colon is an illegal character, which is weird because one of the things that Pro Tools is most used for is mixing films, which has time in it. Uh, it everything is based on minutes and seconds or frames, minutes and seconds and hours, and that's all time-based. And you would use a colon to delineate between minutes and seconds and hours and minutes and minutes and frames, but it's illegal in Pro Tools. So first session with our naming convention, which is in the preferences PDF I handed out last week or two weeks ago, then we're going to create. And then yours is the first time you open it up, your little guide here is going to look like this. What I want you to do is click on this downward facing triangle and it opens it up. And then you can just quickly navigate to your desktop, open this up, and hit save. Now, I'm going to just minimize this for a second. And I'm going to show you some stuff. So our first session is in here. And now look, this container right here, this folder, this is called the session folder. It is the big box that contains all the stuff that we need to run our session. If there is stuff that the session needs to run that's not in that box and you want to share it with me or some or a friend, you're collaborating online, or you want to move it to another computer, you will not be able to run your session because the data that's needed to run the session will not all be easily accessible by Pro Tools. So all your session data needs to be inside that one folder. So if I open this folder, you'll see that there are all these subfolders that Pro Tools has made. These are open during the session, but if I were to close the session, they would disappear because there's no data in, inside of them. So if I open them up, right, there's nothing in there. But this, if there were to become audio files or bounced files or clip groups, if there were data in there, then they would stay when you close this, the session. So this file right here that has the suffix .ptx, that's your Pro Tools session file. So it's really important that you understand the difference between the session folder, which is the big box, and the session file, which is what's running your session. This is the edit arrange page. And then this is your mixer window, right? So in yours, it'll probably look really small. Close this. We're not going to be using this very much this semester. And then once you close it once, you won't have to worry about it going into the future. It'll just open up that way. 
Also, you might have the transport open. Close this. We don't need to have the transport out. Most of you are going to be working with laptops, so we want to minimize the amounts of things that are on the desktop on the on the desktop of your laptop so that you can see more of the edit and arrange page. So this area here on the top, this is called the toolbar. And I'm making a video of this, which I'm going to, this class, which I'm going to post online. So you'll be able to review this whole thing and I'll put chapters in. So you'll be able to scroll back and forth quickly, navigate through it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is your toolbar. Let me, I just have a beverage here. And I'm not going to teach you what all of these things are because some of them you don't need right now. So <clears throat> like these are your edit modes for right now, make sure it's on the blue one, which says grid. You can just click on them and they change colors, right? And because I've got my function keys set up, right? If I press on one, you'll see that it turns to the red one, F1, F2 is the green one. F3 is the yellow one and F4 is the blue one. So instead of having to move my mouse over here to do all this, I can do it from the keyboard and see how much quicker it is. So that's why using the keyboard and key commands will help you become a Pro Tools for any DAW, whether it's Reaper, Logic, Cubase, Performer, Ableton, whatever you end up using after this class is over, right? learning the keyboard commands is really essential. And also, if you're going to, you know, if you do go somewhere else after the class is over, I would suggest learning what's on the arrange page, learning what all these things are and what they do before you start working, you know, get a good sense as to where everything is. And that's the quicker, a pretty good, good way to start learning a piece of software. So right here, this is the zoom controls. We don't need to worry about that. As a matter of fact, we can go over here to this little circle with a downward facing triangle and we can click on that and we can hide that. And that gives you a little bit more space for your laptops, right? If you've got a 13 inch laptop, you want to ma maximize the amount of, you, you want to maximize your screen space. So. Okay, so these are your edit tools. And these, we're gonna work with four this semester. This one here, it's called the trim tool. And I'll show you what these things do today. This is the selector, this is the grabber, and this is the pencil. So these are, the th these are our three friends. And again, Right, you could see how I've got the key. The, I can use the keyboard to navigate between all of those. So learning keyboard commands is really an important. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. Um, okay, this right here is your counter. Now I've got a. Um, I've got a little help up in our Google Classroom to try to explain the counter to everybody. Okay. So let me make this bigger. So we've got in the counter, it's, this is really important. This is how you know where you are. We're musicians. We want to make sure that the counter is set to bars and beats. All right. The first number is the measure, the bar that you're in. The second number is the beat. And the third number is the subdivision of the beat. Now, as you guys, most of you guys know, 
Music is broken up into regular patterns, time signatures, and the most common one is 4-4 four, four time. That means that there's four beats to the measure and the quarter note contains a beat. And the way that you would count that would be one, two, three, four, two, right? And the second measure would be one, two, three, four, and it just repeats. Every measure is four bars. And so the first measure, the first beat would be one slash one. The first measure, the second beat would be one, two. The third beat would be three. The fourth beat would be one, four. The second measure would be two, one, right? Second measure, first beat. Now, this last one here is tricky to understand. So I thought about the best way to explain it, and I came up, I drew this little chart this week that I think would be really helpful. So if you have a beat, one, two, three, four, if you want to play what's called, those are quarter notes, one, two, three, four. If you want to play twice as many notes in each measure, one, two, three, four, those are called eighth notes. And then if you want to play, right, if you want to play four, four times, 16 times as many notes in a measure, those are 16th notes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So those notes between each beat, those are all called subdivisions of the beat. All right, so we're just right now going to be concerned with eighth notes, mostly, but I will introduce 16th notes. So they occur between 2, 1, and 2, 2. These numbers change. And these numbers go between 0 and 959. So from 0 to 959 is actually 960 units. So, in other words, if you go from 1 to 960, that's 960 units. But we're going from 0 to 959, and then it repeats for every beat. Okay? So, these are our quarter notes. So, this would be this digit here. This would be two. Well, if we were back at measure, let's get back to measure one. This is measure one, beat two, measure one, beat three, measure one, beat four, and then it repeats again. Eighth notes, this would be the what we call the and of one. So one and two and three and four and. These three numbers, the 0 to 959, they're called ticks, like ticks on a clock, so they measure time. So the eighth note between each beat is 480 ticks. All right? So one, beat one, measure one, beat one, the second eighth note of that measure is 480. That would be right here. If this was beat two, the second eighth note of that would also be 480. The same with beat three and beat four, because 960 divided by two is 480. I know this sounds like math, but I'm going to show you a quicker way to remember this, but I want to get the foundations off to you guys. So 16th notes are divided up into units of 240 ticks. So the first 16th note of this measure is on 0, 0, 0. It corresponds with the first eighth note and the first quarter note. The second 16th note is on the 240th tick. So if I did this, right, that's the second 16th note of beat 1. The third 16th note is in the same spot as the second eighth note. And they're both on 480 tick. The fourth 16th note 
is on 720. And then that pattern just repeats over and over again. Now, Jeremy um, doesn't really know, know how to read notation. So these are the hieroglyphics for the different kinds of note. This is a quarter note. This is an eighth note. It's a stem with a little flag on it. A 16th note has a stem with two flags on it. Okay, and let me show you now. Let me hide this. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Right here. Let me put a... Just let me quickly put a... Uh, Give me one second. This will help me out in a second. All right. Um, this right here, the word grid, when it's black in the background, it is not active. And when it is green, it is active. For our class, for the first half of the class or so, the grid should always be activated. All right. We're going to learn how to work with the grid. So this lets you know that the grid is activated. If you go here to the right of the grid, it tells you the resolution of the grid. So right now, I'm not sure if you can see this because of the computer screen might not be big enough, but this is the grid value. It's set to 240. So let me zoom in here and let me make this really big. Okay. So this is bar one, beat one right here, and this is bar one, beat two right here. You could see with the counter, and I move my playback head over here, you could see 720, 480, 240 right here. So this is the second 16th note, the third 16th note, and the second eighth note, and the fourth 16th note, and then that pattern repeats. Now, you can see that there's little lines for each 16th note, and then on each beat, there are darker lines. If Pro Tools, wherever you see a triangle, whether it's facing to the left or the right or up and down, that means there are alternate menus. So if I click on th this triangle that's facing down right here, I get a menu which gives me my grid resolution. So if I change that grid to eighth notes, I now only have one line between each quarter note. If I change it to quarter note, I only have quarter notes. And then the quarter notes are light and each measure is dark. Changes to eighth notes, you'll see that the eighth notes are lighter color, the beats are darker, and the, each measure is even darker still. So that's the grid and how you change the resolution of the grid. This is our transport. If you learn the key command for recording, you won't have to have this on. So you can hide this and gain real estate. And again, you would just turn the transport off. And we're going to leave our MIDI controls on. Now, if for some reason your key commands don't work for recording, then you'll have to put your transport back in. But you can minimize the size of the transport so that it only looks like this. And then this red button is recording. So see how it says expanded transport? You could just leave it at the smaller transport. OK. Over here are your MIDI controls. So for right now, We're going to make sure that the metronome is turned on, so that's blue, and then we're going to double click this, and we're going to have our metronome set so that it only sounds during record, not during play and record, only during record. Turn that off. This is MIDI merge. We'll get into that possibly this semester, but the next one is the conductor track. The conductor track needs to be on. So that's blue. That gives us our tempo. And these are our output meters, which lets us know the level that our session is outputting. Okay, give me one second. I need to um, get something set back to zero because I was using another session before.
in my last class earlier today. Okay, great. This area here, whoops, excuse me, this area here, these are our rulers, okay? Rulers measure things. So we can customize this as well. Right now it's set to bars and beats, minutes and seconds, tempo, meter, and markers. For our class, right now, we only need to have tempo and meter. Bars and beats, yeah, you can't get rid of bars and beats. Let me just see something. Right. You can't get rid of the time base. So we can just use these three. And again, it saves us some room in the um, edit window. Okay, so I'm going to delete this. So we're going to add a track. We want to add a click track. Okay. So Command Shift N brings up this new menu. And for the first part of class, we're only going to be working with instrument tracks for like the first few weeks. And then we'll work with audio tracks later on. So for right now, we're going to do a click track. So we need a mono instrument track. And I'm going to name it right here. Click. So mono and stereo. We're going to almost always be working with stereo tracks. But our click track is in mono and it's on an instrument track. So you'll just scroll down to instrument tracks. Don't worry about ticks or samples. Don't worry about that. It will default to the right one. And then you just name this by highlighting and deleting and then just writing the words click in there. And then you create. Now that's great, but <clears throat> that doesn't, if I play this, there's no click. If I go into record, there won't be any click. So what we want to do is we want to set up this area here because probably when you first open up Pro Tools, it's going to look something like this, right? So again, a downward facing triangle right here. Click on that. And we want to see instrument inserts. For right now, that's good. If you want to add your I.O., that would be great too. So this would be the maximum for right now, but you need the instrument and the inserts. So why you need the inserts is you're gonna click here and you're gonna go and you're gonna go down to other to, uh, instrument. Actually, it's, yes. Okay, so right click on, right, right so, so right, do you see what I'm doing right here? With the mouse, right click on on the uh, on the name and see how another menu comes up. It can hit delete. Yeah. So if something if you're following along and something like that happens, stop me and ask because that somebody you're not the only person who's going to be doing that, right? Other people will do that too, so we can all learn. Go ahead. No, just A dash E. We're just A dash E. So see how mine is set up right now? No, you don't. You don't. No. Um, okay. So if you now, this brings me to another thing which I should have gone to first. There's this whole setup in here that I want to look at. So if you go to preferences, and again, these are on the videos that I've set up. Uh, on that I sent um, links to that are on my YouTube page, little 10, 15 minute videos. So we want to set this up so that our tool tips show us function and details. So that'll help you organize plugin menus by category and manufacturer. That's very helpful. Always color coding. That's another thing that I'm really big with. 
always display marker colors. MIDI note shows color, color velocity. MIDI note color shows velocity. But this is the big one here. Default track color coding. Tracks and MIDI channels. And the clips within those tracks will be the same as the track color. So click on that. And then if you scroll all the way over to MIDI and you click this right here, automatically create click track in new sessions. This will automatically create a click track when you open up the session. That doesn't help us now, but I want to show you how to make one manually. All right, so now if we go to Avid, it has click two. I've got a lot more plugins than you guys do. I have a very complicated setup. Don't worry about that. And then our click track shows up. Yes, so if you go to inserts and you click on that, you'll see this menu that says plugin. And because I've set up for manufacturer and category, I can I know it's under the Avid category. You'll see click two right up here. Okay, great. So now we've got our click track up. Right, and now I'm recording something and you can hear the click track play. All right, so now I want an instrument track to make sound with, okay? So we're gonna be using, we're gonna be using something called Expand 2. Expand 2 is what's known as a rompler, R-O-M-P-L-E-R. That means that all the sounds are stored in ROM, read-only memory. And you can edit the sounds, and you can do quite a bit to the sounds, but the sounds are baked into the um, software. You can't make, you can't import new sounds. You can create new sounds from the data that's in there. They're all audio samples that have been programmed to create instruments, but you can't add new sounds to it from the outside. So let's do this again. So command, command, shift, N, one new, now we're gonna do stereo. So be, be sure that instrument tracks that we're gonna play and make music on, they're all gonna be in stereo, stereo, stereo. Instrument track, and we're gonna create it. And we're gonna write, and we're gonna click here again and we're just going to go into instrument and it's at the very bottom of the instrument list you won't have this many it says expand to at the very bottom oops and there it is it shows up so now does anybody know what this graphic representation of this instrument is called what the shorthand for that is yes matthew Correct, a GUI, graphic or graphic or graphical, uh, graphic or graphical user interface. Okay, so every one of these looks different depending upon the software you're using, but in Pro Tools and in all of the DAWs, they do it a little differently, but each one does something similar to this. And that is up here where you say it says preset. If you click, it says factory default. This is the librarian menu. So if you click on this, it opens up a whole bunch of folders with a whole bunch of sounds. And there are hundreds and hundreds of sounds in here. And some of these sounds are good. I can use some of these sounds professionally and some of these are not very good but they're certainly more than good enough for us to get started working and making MIDI tracks. So I want to, I want to, um,
Yes, no. So do you have expand to open? Yeah. And you're seeing this on your screen? Multi-channel. All right, hold on. Let me show you again. Okay, so multi-channel plugin, go to instrument, and then scroll all the way to the bottom of this instrument menu. Yours won't be as massive as this, but um, expand to. It's at the very bottom. Letter X. Is there in yes, correct. Ah, so you that's one that you had to download from your Avid account. All right, so everybody... That's doing this right. I had I had mentioned that you should download the um, uh, Air First Instruments. I think it's called bundle and Expand Two. They're both in your Avid account, so you should download those and install the install them. Noam, do you have anything in that folder? So what do you have in there? Yeah, you should actually, you should have this. There are things that you can use in here, like the ocarina in here is tremendous. I use, I've used that on film scores. It's, it's beautiful. And there's some, and there are other things that you can do in here that uh, um, I'll be teaching in the film scoring class Wednesday, uh, to, that you can really make these sounds sound much better. But um, it's free, and you, you know, it's part of your um, owning Pro Tools. Okay, and the Air Instruments as well, because there's some good stuff in there as, as well. All right, so up here in this preset area, now, now Matthew, did you have a question? Okay, so here's the, this is called the librarian menu, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a drum kit in here, and I'm just going to, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down, and there are all these different drum kits, but I'm just going to go to number one here, zero one, it's called pop kit. All right, so before I play anything, I want to double click on where it says Inst1 and I'm going to name that Drums. Ah, this happened before. Okay, you have to give me a second here. I'm having an issue with my system. And I uh, thought I fixed it yesterday but apparently not. My keyboard, there's something wrong with the USB out of my master keyboard. So I'm going to just, just to show you that you can use a tiny little keyboard to do this work as well. Okay, so I've got that record enabled and I've got a whole drum kit here. Right? Now, this drum kit is set up to what's called, and every drum kit that's in this menu is set up so that this lower C, which is down here on my big, uh, well, you can't see it because, uh, let's see, you can't see it because of the way my camera's set up, but it's one of the lower C's is the kick drum. And if you don't have it on your MIDI keyboard, your MIDI keyboard might have octave switches, right? So if I click here, like, What did I do here? Did I turn the volume down? Okay. Right, so you can see these are different. These are different drums here. I'm playing the same pitch, but I'm switching the octave. So they're all set up so that this C is a kick drum, snare drum, cross stick, claps, Second snare drum, right? That's like a rim shot. Tom toms, hi hat, closed, foot hi hat, open hi hat, crash cymbals, ride cymbal, crash, crash, and then assorted 
percussion, right? So all of them are set up with the same lineup of notes. And what's good about that is you can create a drum pattern. And if you don't like the drum sound, you could switch to a different drum and get different, you know, just replace the drum sound and keep your pattern. So now there's two ways with which you can enter notes. So for I'm going to show the first way is to just play them in, right? I don't need to have this open right now. So you see right here where it says count off. I'm going to click on that and that says two bars. So in order to make Pro Tools record, if you've got an extended keyboard like this, if you've got an iMac with an extended keyboard, it's the number three on the numeric keypad. Just remember, the numeric keypad is different than these numbers on the top here. They do different things. If you don't, and you're just working with a laptop, if we've done the um, spotlight adjustment at the beginning of the class, if you've done that to your computer, then to get this to record, it's first thing you have to do is make sure that this record button is enabled. So you click on it and it blinks red. Then you go command and the space bar. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right, and I just recorded a drum, a drum part. Now, if you want to play at a different tempo, right here you've got your tempo ruler. So you make sure you're at bar one where you want to start because you can change tempos in Pro Tools virtually anywhere you want. But for right now, you want to get your tempo to start that you like. So if you double click, if you click on this plus right here, it opens up this other window. And you can either tap in a tempo, but if you've got a feel in your head, one, two, if you click on the T key, which is this here, one and two and three and four and, well, if I want to go slower, one and two and three, you see that it puts the um, tempo that you're tapping. So I'm going to do about, so I was getting a ballpark of about 72. So let me do this again. Two and three and four and two and two, three and four and. Right, and I've just recorded a little drum beat. So a little, not timing wasn't so great, but that's one way to do it. Let me undo that. Now, for those of you without a MIDI keyboard, you see right here, the bottom of this page, there is an upward facing arrow. If you click on that, it opens up what's called the MIDI editor. And you see how you can resize all sorts of stuff here. And if you hover in an area, the mouse changes to a cross and then you can click and drag. So you want to have this be this area here be wide enough that you can read your tracks because this is called the tracks list. So this will have a list of all the tracks in your session. This is your piano roll editor and this is that can be resized this way by hovering over the bottom border and dragging up and down. And then this thing in the bottom, these are your these are your edit lanes, it's called, right? And this is the lane view selector. We're going to click on this downward facing triangle to just hide that. Now, for those of you that do not have a MIDI keyboard, you can still enter notes. So I'm going to enter a drum pattern and then I'll show you what I've done. Oops.
All right, so I just drew those in, right? I never work this way, but it's good to know how to do this because you can create music like this. Um, so for Richard, you don't have a keyboard, so you're gonna, until we get you one, you're gonna have to do this. It's a little cumbersome, but I'll take that into account. Uh, just do the best you can. All right, so let me just show you um, something about this though. Right here, I've got my my grid set up to 480, which is an eighth note, right? So this is, right, so this is the MIDI editor, this whole area. It also has its own toolbar. And the way that you know that this toolbar is active as opposed to this toolbar up here is that this has an amber outline. So if I go up here, this now has an amber outline. I'm not sure it shows over the computer, but if I'm down here, this has an amber outline. You got your tools here. They only work down here. These tools work up here in the edit page. These tools work, these tools right here work in the MIDI editor. So if I change the grid to 16th notes, I can now take this edit tool here, which is the trimmer, and I can trim some of these notes to make 16th notes, right? As opposed to eighth notes. And then if I wanted to have a couple of 16th notes in the hi-hat, I can use the selector tool, which is this middle one here, and I'm gonna teach you a new key command that's very important, so I would write this down. So let's say I want to make a 16th note here. Divide this into two. Command E, and it splits that right into two. And I'll do the same thing here, and here, and here, and now I've got a little six. Right, you see how that's, you can change these things. Now, I prefer to play this stuff in, but I want to show you how to enter notes in in as many ways as possible because to be honest with you there might be stuff that you want that you can conceptualize but you can't play on the keyboard because you're not a skilled keyboard player well that's part of the beauty of this practice is that there are alternate ways of entering notes that you can realize your ideas and this is one way Yeah, it's got to speak a little louder, Dronder. Do you have a USB cable? Is Does your MIDI controller have a USB cable? A and it's plugged in? Okay, so when you have, you've got this record enabled, correct? And when you play a note, there's no sound. What is it, so if you click, all right, so. All right, so go to setup, MIDI, input devices. And let me know if you see your device in this list, in your list on your computer. And it's got a check there. Okay, so do me another favor. Command Shift N. Oh, I, I, you know, so do you see over here on the side where it says tracks? Okay, is there an orange keyboard next to your instrument track? What you've most likely done at this point is you've most likely put an audio track instead of an instrument track. So let's do it again. Like that, that that's the most, that that's happens so often. And that happens to people even after like six months of using this so Command Shift N, Stereo, 
instrument track. Did you find the where it says instrument track? Good. And then say OK and make that happen. And then what you can do is you can um, opt, you can like just click on, on the expand and just drag it down into the instrument into the instrument track, the same slot on the instrument track below it. Do you understand what I mean? Now record enable. And it's working. Yes. Correct. And then does it say over here, does it say expand to one dash one here? And then this says all. right above expand to one dash one. All right, so let's let's move on and then we'll we'll take a few minutes after this class is over and I'll uh, we'll, you'll share me your screen and I'll talk you through it. Yes, Matthew. Uh-huh. Okay. So, okay, so go to setup. Playback engine. And make sure it says um, built-in output. It says playback engine. Does it say Pro Tools aggregate or something like that? Yeah. All right. So if I'm gonna have to get somebody at the, <laughs> to help you with the with the PC. That's like like I said earlier. That's like my out of my out of my ballpark. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I should learn how to use that stuff, but okay. So we've I've got a little drum track here, right? So I want to command shift and new stereo instrument track. And I want to play a piano part on top of that. So um, air cut it comes with something called mini grand, which we'll use for piano. And I'm going to call this piano. It's always important to name your tracks before you record anything. Very important to do that because you see this blue area that the drums are recorded on. This is called a clip. And notice how it's named drums. If this was just instrument, it would just, it wouldn't tell you what, it would just say that this was an instrument track, but it wouldn't tell you that this is a drum clip. You should really, and that, and you can change the name afterwards, but it's just easier to always make sure that your tracks are named. So, okay, so I'm going to, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Right? So I just recorded a two bar piano bit. Now there's a little bit at the end that I didn't like right here. So if I highlight that and I open up my MIDI editor, I can click, I can make sure that I'm using the selector tool and you see this stuff here. I can click and drag to the right and delete it. Now you have to make sure that you're, we're in, grid mode so you have to make sure that you're on a grid point 
You can't be between a grid point. And then you can just, like I said, I highlight that area there and delete that. And then I can select both of these. Command D duplicates that. So now I've got a four bar. Okay, so I want to add a base to that. Command Shift N, new stereo instrument track. And I'm gonna call this base. And then I am going to put um, expand to, and I'll call up a base, and I'll just put the first one up. Just put uh, no. Let me just do this soft pick base. Now I can either play a bass line in, but I think what I'd like to do is. I'll draw a baseline in. And I'm gonna do something really quick. Now, if I play this back, it's not gonna sound very good. Right, it's because all these notes are really short. So what we can do is take this guy here, which is our trimmer tool, and we can lengthen some of these notes. Right, and I'm just making them, and let's listen to this. I like this one a little shorter. So I did that without playing at all. Now, I can also change the pitch. So if I just click on this, right, and I use the up arrow, it will change these notes. And then if I use the right arrow, I can go to the next note. Right, and I could change my baseline. Right, and that now that it's up that high, it's a little too short, so I can make this longer. Okay, so that's how you could change the pitch of notes, and you could just enter in notes like that and then create the part that you want. Now, there are many other things I can do to make this sound better by changing the dynamics, but let's take one step at a time. Which piano are you using in Expand? I'm not using Expand. I'm using Mini Grand. Do you have that, Matthew? Yeah, so that's the one that we'll use because that actually is not a bad built-in piano sample. Um, not bad at all. Some of the electric pianos in Expand are pretty good. The Fender Rhodes, the suitcase, I think it's called. All right, so I have this, I like it, I'm gonna duplicate it. And now I've got this. Let's change this note here, right? So I'm gonna use the up arrow. Or you could just, you could use the grabber tool and just click and drag it up. And you'll notice that you can, as you're moving this note up and down, you're seeing on the piano keyboard over here, the pitch gets gray. And then I want to add maybe a little bit more motion there. Now, to get it to play back from the beginning, you hit the return key and it goes back to the beginning. But what if I want to start right there? 
right? If I go to this to the uh, selector and I just click on this time on the ruler, the time ruler here, or I could click on the time ruler there, you see this fl flashing line here is called the playback head. Okay, it's very important to save, always save, all right? Now, what I want you to do for next week, to the best of your ability, is to create an eight measure piece of music from scratch. You can. an eight measure piece of music from scratch. You can use a pop song if you like, if you've got sheet music or some song that you like. And you could choose whatever instruments you want. You could have, you could have it be piano and bass and drums and a melody instrument, or you could have it be whatever, whatever instruments you want. All right, but four tracks, eight bars, just an eight bar piece. Just get it in the best you can um, this is going to be a multi-week assignment because each week we're going to do a little bit more to make it better. And I'll introduce some new techniques each week. But I just want you to get started, get something in there. So it's eight measures long. And so right now we're at four. You can make up something. I, I don't really care what it is. What I want you to do is to just get started. And the best way to learn how to do this stuff is to just do it. Um, and what I will tell you is that rather than waiting until Sunday night and spending four hours trying to cram something in, spend 15 or 20 minutes a day and make small little tasks. So your first task, let's say on tomorrow, will be to set your session up, make sure you've got your click track, make sure that all your preferences are set up the way we went over in class today, and um, get four instrument tracks open name them, decide what instruments you might like to use, and we're going to use Expand 2 or Mini Grand for piano, and that would be all you would do tomorrow. Then maybe the next day you would think, well, I want to play this song by so-and-so, the begin, like maybe the first eight bars, so I'll do the melody and the, the, the chords and a bass line and maybe like just even if you just do if you're going to do drums maybe even just a hi-hat going t -t 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 -t. that's fine you know, it doesn't have to be anything complex i want you to show me that you can figure out how to do some of this stuff right part of my teaching philosophy is to show you stuff and ask you to do stuff that might be a little bit above your head why is that not above your talent ability but above what you know technically about how to do this practice because a part of learning how to do this stuff is learning how to figure out stuff on your own. When I, like I, when I started sequencing, there was no internet. I I had to like read these books that were translated from Japanese into America, and it was incredibly difficult. It was it was horrible, and I figured stuff out just by doing it and coming up with my own solutions. So um, if you make stuff, if you do stuff that doesn't, that's, I think is going in the wrong direction, I will gently correct you, but I won't be dissing your grade because this is, like I said, it's a multi-week project. We're gonna be you know, making a, a track that's longer than this and has more instruments and there's some editing going on. That's gonna be the MIDI portion of this class. But I just want you to get started um, it's already, you know, the semester started three weeks ago and we're, we're like a, a little bit behind the eight ball as it is. So let's just get started, get something down. So four instruments and do the best you can. And also remember that instruments don't have to play every note from beginning to end, right? If I were to put a melody line in here, it might be do dee dee dee. 
バーバラピッパピッパルリラバルンドゥピア Right? I mean, so it's only playing in a few spots. It's not everywhere. So just remember that. It doesn't have to be like a completely black page with lots of notes all over the place.、Um, so you're going to do that. And what you're going to do when you're done is you're going to take your session for and make sure you save before you、um, do this. Right? So if I were to go back to Pro Tools. And save. And then or you could quit out and save. It doesn't matter. It's your choice. But I just, I'm going to leave the session open for a few minutes more. Right click on this, and you're going to compress first session. And this is what you're going to upload either to our Google Classroom or into our.、Um, oops, my fault. Thank you. I am an idiot. I've got this fancy machine <laughs> and I didn't do it correctly. All right, here we go. So we've got this right here, the session folder. Not this. I don't want this. I want the folder. You right click on that and you compress that. And this compressed file that has dot zip at the end, you either upload it onto Google, onto our classroom. Or you go to our Dropbox and Recording Studio Fundamentals, Assignment. Oh, due 9 14. No, this is going to be due、um, next week. I'll change. Let me change the date on this. It's going to be due on the 21st. And you're just going to drag this into there. And there you go. And that's it. And then I will be able to download that and make feedback videos for you and upload those into a folder that'll be in here. So I'll type that up and put that into Google Classroom so, so that you can see, see it or something written out. But is there any questions on that? Yes, you can quantize rhythm. Right. We're going to work on that. I'm going to teach, Caitlin, I'm going to teach you that. Yes, you could do like this, so much you could do in Pro Tools that you could do in Logic, what the logic that you could do in Pro Tools. So,、um, yes, we'll work on that next. I want to do small, small little things at a time. You know what I mean? That'll be, I want to teach you how to manually fix things because、um, to get a human feel. So, quantizing is where you, Lock everything to a grid value. And that's not always human. So, what you might want to do is just fix a few notes. So, I want to teach you how to manually clean up some rhythms. So, that's why I don't want you to worry about doing that、uh, for next week. Okay?、Um, no, they're not fairly similar between the two, the keystrokes are not. No, the keyboard shortcuts. Nope. Four. And it's only good, just eight measures, you know, not, or end on the downbeat of measure nine, you know,、um, just not very long. And just get the notes in, do the best you can, and then the next week's assignment will be to clean it up. <laughs> you know, and make it a little bit more musical where I teach you how to edit a little bit more. All right. So, from my perspective, part of learning how to do this is, is to understand where this entire practice came from. Right? So, let me show you something.
I'm just opening up a session. Uh, for a project I worked on recently. It's taking a while to load because it's there's a lot of tracks. Um, and I just want to show you wh where you can get to with this study. Where, from where we are now um, and, sh and then go and show you where all this came from and where it started. So while this is loading in, uh, I guess you can't see it loading in, so let's do this. When for me, sequencing for me started in about 1984 with the advent of MIDI. And MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Prior to this happening, instruments communicated with each other by something called control voltage. And you could use a control voltage from one synthesizer to control another one. The problem with that was that there weren't standardized equivalence between the different manufacturers. So for example, Moog and Arp might have used um, something like volt per octave, and Yamaha and Korg might have used hertz per volt per, per volt or something. I forget what it is, but they had they didn't have anything standardized. So in 1984, MIDI was was came out and that was all of the synthesizer manufacturers got together and decided upon a protocol where all the instruments could speak to each other and control each other. And um, I got my first MIDI keyboards in 1984. I'd, I'd had synthesizers before that, but they were all, uh, they didn't have um, MIDI in them. I had uh, something called a Maxi Korg, which was a two voice paraphonic synthesizer that I played live. And when high school, we had a mini Moog in our electronic music studio, which we had in our high school, which I can't believe. So when I got my first few keyboards, I bought a little piece of hardware that Yamaha made called a QX21. And it was a hardware sequencer and it could do two tracks, uh, two channels with 16 MIDI tracks on each channel. And it was a little box with a tiny little screen that was like this big, right? on it and the box itself the box itself was like about this big and it had this tiny little screen that had two digits on it it was either a letter of um, a through h and a number of zero through eight or something like that it was called hexadecimal and or yeah zero through nine it did go up to nine and all the functions were control it was it was like uh, it was mind-blowing to try to figure this stuff out with just a bad manual there was no YouTube tutorials. There was no college courses that taught anything about this stuff at that time. And you go from that to what we're capable of doing now. It's, it's, it's really crazy. So So this is a, an orchestral session that I've got set up here for a project I did at the beginning of August. Okay. So I'm just going to play this. And there's no sound. Oh, this isn't the final version. All right, that's fine. I can play this.
Anyway, this wasn't the final one. I should have had that ready. But this is a big orchestral track, and it only looks like a few things are happening, but these are all track folders, which is a newer feature in Pro Tools that all the other DAWs had. And when I open this up, you could see that there's like, right, an insane number of tracks here. So I've got 124 tracks here, music tracks, right? Now, not everything's playing all the time, but this is where we are now, how, how complex this can become, this study. Well, so this folder tracks is, is old in every DAW, but it's new in Pro Tools. So that, might, that was actually the first project I used folder track for. What I like about folder tracks is that it, it, it reduces the amount of um, looking up and down the page I have to do. And it keeps things organized and it just shows less stuff on the, um, on the screen. So this is a woman named Suzanne Ciani. Uh, Suzanne Ciani in the mid-1970s through the entire 1980s was incredibly busy a musician in New York City. And she was a synthesis. And she did most of her work for advertising agencies. So she created the sound of... Um, a bottle of 7-Up being flipped open and the fizzy sound. She created that on something called a Buchla synthesizer. And, she, you know, they all, all the advertising agencies used her. She had her own jingle company in the um, 1980s. A friends of mine used to work for her. And she's, um, and she's really like an expert on synthesis. And so... She uses mostly a system called the Buchla, which was made by a West Coast musician named, a synthesizer developer named Don Buchla. And then on the East Coast here, we had Dr. Moog and um, Robert Moog, who created the Moog systems, which this is. Uh, and actually, for your benefit, um, just for your knowledge, Dr. Moog, Bob Moog, who's one of the most important figures in electronic music and in pop music because his Moog synthesizers are all over pop music even today. Um, he went to Queens College in the 1950s. So he was, he was a, a physics major, I believe, but he did take music classes. And my teacher, Professor Berkowitz, who's no longer alive, he was teaching at Queens College in the 50s um, and he had Dr. Moog for a couple, in a couple of his classes. So um, this is a modular synthesizer, and we're going to watch this. And basically, there are eight or 16 what they call steps, right? And the synthesizer just keeps on cycling through those eight or 16 steps over and over again, back and forth. And that step, those steps, that's called a step sequencer. So this is the beginnings of that, even though this is a recent recording. And... Um, she changes the pitch and she, she, she plays some notes on the keyboard, but then she changes all these knobs and these to change the values uh, and the timbre of the synthesizer. And let me just play you a little bit of this. It's only three minutes long, but you can see what I'm talking about. And I'll point some stuff out while it's playing.
So you hear that pattern is repeating over and over again, right? So I'm going to just back this up a little bit. So this guy right here, you see this is a line of lights that goes back and forth. That's the step sequencer right there. Right? And you can just see the light goes back, goes from one end and then back to the beginning. It goes from left to right. I pasted the link into the chat in case you want to watch this. I'm going to stop this for a second and I'm going to do this. should have had this bookmarked. I apologize. Oh, I have this. Hold on one second. I want to land a copy. What's up with that? There we go. Yay, I did something right for a change.
Okay, so that was pretty cool, right? <laughs> so literally, what we're doing in the computer, this is this was the antecedents for that. Now, somebody in the pop music field who was really um, important Okay, who was really important in um, bringing synthesizers into pop music was Pete Townsend of the band The Who. He was really one of the first people to do it. And um, he also was one of the first people to have a recording studio in his house. And he would record things using sequencers, using, you could see he's got this ARP 2500 in back of him. Anyway, um, he used synthesizers in really unusual ways. So you could see him playing around with that. Now, let me just show you. This is, um, here, let's look at this one, actually. This one's a little bit better. Yeah, this one's a little bit better. So, you know, him doing that type stuff really changed the course of pop music. Um, yeah, because after that, in the 70s, there was all sorts of uh, synthesizers being used by all sorts of progressive bands, pop bands. I mean, there were pop songs that were, um, like there's this song called, uh, this was a big hit when I was like in elementary school, I think.
So this is a bunch of studio guys. They had like a couple of hours in the studio and some synthesizers and drums in there, and they just fooled around and came up with this thing and put it out. And it was it sold a lot of copies back then, but it was such a novelty, and it was really literally the, the first time I'd heard anything like that. Um, but as far as the first sequencer I used... This right here. You see, like, this, like, what is that? So this is the thing that I learned how to sequence on, right, before your parents even knew each other. Just kidding. Um, but um, you see how it's developed over the years to where we are now, which is that um, every film... Every film is recorded in a, is written composed in a sequencer. Almost every pop song is composed in a sequencer. Um, it, it's it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And so, learning how to operate one is almost essential if you want to be a creative person. Sequencers are used in live performances, not to pl play backing tracks, but they run the lighting shows. Right, MIDI, the MIDI protocol is in theater on Broadway is used to run all the lights, light changes and everything. So it's just, it's really a, it's amazing how it's, how it started out with such, in such, with such different sounds and with different ways of doing stuff and how it's evolved to where we are today. And who knows in 50 years what it'll be. So, all right. So I'm going to put up, I'm going to edit the video. I put up the first half up to the point where I started talking about all these synthesizers. Um, and I'll, I'll post that up onto uh, YouTube in the next few days so you'll be able to review it. I'll send a link for it. And wonder if you want to hang around and you can share me your screen. But aside from that, unless there's any questions, I will catch you guys next week. Great. Have a great um, day, everyone. Thank you, Luciana.